I couldn't do anything other than just like lie there and try and sleep. So I didn't feel what I was feeling. At that point in time, there was definitely parts of me where I was like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Mm. I had to get talked off the ledge of quitting. I just don't know if I can do this. Like, I don't know how long I can do this. Jesse Pollock is the creator of BASE. Coinbase is Ethereum Layer 2 network, offering a secure, low-cost, developer-friendly way for anyone, anywhere to build decentralized apps on-chain. What is your mission? Well, the mission right now is to build a global on-chain economy that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom. And that's BASE. We're literally trying to take these economic systems that in many cases are 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 years old, and we're trying to build a new system, we're trying to upgrade the system. I played a lot of sports growing up. I started playing competitive soccer when I was like four years old. I like really wanted to be all time. It definitely put something in my head. What's your biggest criticism of the base ecosystem today? I think in crypto, we can sometimes just get confused by the economic incentives and the tokens and the game theory. And we can lose sight of the fact that like we have to build something people want. Where creators can put their content on chain and they make the money. And where anyone anywhere, regardless of who they are, regardless of where they're born, regardless of what phone they have, has access to the same apps. So you were telling me about this moment where everything was doing great on the outside, but from the inside you were kind of burned out. Have you ever felt like giving up? Um. 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel? Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests, and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter, the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana, and Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer 2 with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. How was your day? It was a good day. Yeah, I um, I went down to Mountain View, California, like which is right down in the South Bay yesterday, um, last night, because all of the product managers at Coinbase were coming together for a conference, like a PM con. It's like a summit, basically, for all of them. And a big part of my job is influencing Coinbase and trying to get Coinbase to come on chain. And a lot of that is influencing people. And so I drove down last night, did dinner with everyone. And then this morning was there for breakfast. And then I did like an hour long talk where I was like, 20 minutes of, you know, here's how I'm thinking about base, here's the progress we've made in the first year, and then 40 minutes of just Q&A and kind of like answering people's questions and hopefully helping shift the company more on chain. How is that going? It's going good. We've come a long way. You know, like a year ago, base didn't exist. You know, mm -hmm. it was, it, it just launched. Um, no one really knew what to make of it. Two years ago, the idea of base didn't exist. And the idea of bringing Coinbase on chain was something that I had in my head and something that I talked about with people, but no one really knew what it meant. And I think everyone kind of thought, oh, that's just like Jesse being a little bit crazy and too far in the future. And today, you know, there are teams across every single part of the company that are building on chain, that are writing smart contracts, that are deploying them on base, that are figuring out how to integrate them into our consumer experiences, our institutional experiences. Um, and every single day, it feels like it's accelerating. You know, and, and just an you know, anecdote on that. Um, right before I gave my talk, Brian uh, Armstrong, CEO, gave a talk, and um, he got asked, you know, like what what is kind of like you know uh, what's kind of keeping you, what's making you nervous, or what's the thing that you think we're going to look back on a year on and wish we'd move faster on or made a change on faster. And he said, I, the thing that keeps me up is that we're still too off chain, and we have to figure out how do we move on chain faster. Uh, because if we can't figure out how to move on chain faster, we're going to uh, miss the opportunity to use this technology shift to transform our business for the better and to reach more customers and to increase economic freedom globally. And so I think that that for me and for him and for so many people at the company is this kind of you know existential moment where we're seeing the technology platform evolve in front of us. And we're seeing how failed these systems are that have been powering our global economy for the last 50 years. Um, but we're also fighting against the inertia of the systems being entrenched and Coinbase being a big company. And we're trying to figure out how do we avoid the innovator's dilemma, right? And how do we make this transition to be fully on chain? Is it even possible at that scale, right? Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to find out, but mm -hmm. I, I think it's possible. I, I, I do think that it is 
uniquely possible when you have a founder CEO like Brian, who so deeply understands crypto and mm. is willing to make bets and back people like me who are kind of pushing the edge and say, like, I don't, maybe he doesn't even understand it all the time, although increasingly he understands it better than anyone, but he's still willing to be like, I believe in the principle and I'm willing to fight for that principle. I'm willing to do things that no one else would do if they were a traditional public company CEO. Um, and so I think that, that that means that we have a good shot. And then the thing for me that's like, kind of the defining part of that question is if we can't do it, no one can. And mm -hmm. I think everyone, I think people will be able to, but I really think we need to like pave the way. We need to figure out what is the path to transform a business from off-chain to on-chain and how do you make that path good for the business, good for customers, good for employees, good for the people who are building. Um, and I think once we define that, as we've already started defining it with the whole base effort and all of the work we're doing to bring things on chain, I think that's gonna clarify it for many, many other companies. And they're gonna say, oh, this is how you do it. And then a lot of them are gonna try and run that playbook. Now, mm. how many of them make it through? I don't know. I mean, look at the internet, how many companies made it to the other side of the internet? A lot, but a lot also didn't make it. And if you look at the businesses that rose and are the most successful today, almost all of them are new. And with this technology platform shift, I do think we're going to see a lot of new players emerge as winners and um, emerge as having a massive impact. I also think we're going to see existing platforms. Who are you? <laughs> Who am I? I'm Jesse. Um, I'm Jesse. I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., um, which is capital in the United States, for those who don't know. I uh, grew up uh, going to Quaker school. Quakerism is like a sect of Christianity, but the whole idea with Quakerism is there's no religious leader, like there's no priest or, or pastor or anything like that. Um, instead, the kind of like core principle is the idea that there's that of God in everyone. And so it's like, all of us are holy in a way. And I'm not a religious person. I didn't grow up like being religious, but I grew up in this I, in this kind of like culture of Quakerism, which was really like, you know, the values are simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship. It's all about like, how do we make the world the best it can be? And then how do we work together to accomplish that and work together to make our lives and, you know, the communities that we live in better. And that was my first, you know, 18 years of existence. My uh, mom was a midwife once called the LeBron James of midwifery. So she's delivered like thousands of babies, brought thousands of babies into the world. My dad was a, a labor lawyer. He worked with labor unions and um, represented them, you know, all, all across the country. And they, they raised me to, you know, think I could accomplish anything. And uh, I always knew from a young age, I wanted to do something that would change the world. And I think I'm, I think I'm starting to make some progress. What is your mission? What is my mission? Well, the mission right now is to build a global on-chain economy that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom. And that's base, right? Like we're literally trying to take these um, systems, these economic systems that in many cases are state by state or country by country or, you know, large bank by large bank. Um, and uh, in all cases are 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 years old. And in all cases are failing the people who are trying to leverage those systems because they're too expensive, because they're too slow, uh, because they're too frustrating, uh, because they're too discriminatory, uh, because depending on where you're born or where you live or what phone you have, you're going to have different access. And we're trying to build a new system. We're trying to upgrade the system and create a new global on-chain economy. So global is globalness, on-chain is a new technology platform, economy is what we're building. And then we're going to use that to increase innovation by supporting entrepreneurs and helping them build new businesses in this open platform, increase creativity by making it so creators who right now are bringing their creativity onto centralized platforms and earning not nothing, but essentially nothing compared to the billions and trillions of dollars that those platforms are taking in terms of profits. And we're going to bring them into a new internet that actually works for them and helps them earn from their creativity. And then we're gonna increase freedom by putting everyone on a level playing field and making it so regardless of where you're born, regardless of where you live, regardless of what phone you have, you have the same opportunity and you can uh, have the same tools to start your business. You can have the same tools to, to build your wealth and grow your family. Uh, and you can uh, have the, the same access and opportunity that anyone else in the world has. And I think if we can accomplish that, um, you know, taking it back to like what I always thought I would do is like make the world a better place. Like that's, that's a better world, a world where we have a global economy that anyone can participate in that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom. I think it's going to be a, a much better place for everyone. I had a conversation with uh, Kiao Wang from uh, mm -hmm. Alliance DAO a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. 
and he said that there are two main straight two main traits that they're looking uh, for when they invest in world class crypto founders. The first one is a high degree of autism, which helps you think independently. <laughs> the second one, I, he was kind of half joking. Right? Yeah, 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 I guess. There's it. always 50% yeah. of truth in every joke, right? The second one is a big chip on the shoulder, right? Mm. Childhood trauma that makes you work your ass off because you have something to prove to the world. Mm -hmm. As a crypto founder doing pretty well, would you say that you share one or both of these traits? Hmm. Um. I mean, I, 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 I've never been diagnosed with autism, um, but I would say, I mean, I've talked about it at various points in, in my life that I, uh, with my therapist and coach, I definitely have, um, you know, I have traits that are, I think, mostly around like perfection and mm. some level of control and focus um, that, you know like define a lot of my character like a lot of who i am you know it's like i am willing like i'm able you put me you put me you give me something that i'm interested in and you sit me down in an airplane and i'll like lock in for like eight hours mm -hmm. you know i'll just open up my computer and i'll just focus on that thing for eight straight hours and my wife will be sitting next to me she's like what is going on like i'll close my laptop at the end of eight hours and she's like how did you just do that and so there's like a focus component of it um yeah so i think i think there's something there and then on the the chip on my shoulder, I don't think. I mean, look, I had a very blessed childhood, um, happy family, um, like, yeah, happy family. Really grateful for my parents and my siblings, and you know, all of the great privileges I had in going to school. And so, I don't know if I had a lot of trauma in my childhood. The the thing that I will say though that I do think gave me a chip on my shoulder is I played a lot of sports growing up. So I I started playing competitive soccer when I was like four years old. Um, just, you know, played all the way through college, and I will say that I was a like a B plus at best soccer player. Mm, I was you know? about to say often it's <laughs> when you don't do well, right? Okay. Yeah, I like <laughs> really wanted to be all time, and I worked really hard. Like I would spend summers and just work all summer, mm. like run all summer. Um, yeah, and it's you know that's now has paying dividends my vo2 max i just did a vo2 max test and my vo2 max is like through the roof it's awesome but i um i worked really really hard and i was always like a b to b plus player and it meant that i spent a lot of time like getting benched or sitting on the bench and like watching other people play and i think that that experience of just like working really freaking hard and still not being able to be the best um at the sport that i wanted to be the best at it definitely like put something in my head where it's just like, I need to, I need to work really, really hard. And even then, I don't know if I'll ever be the best, but like, that's the only path through. Um, so yeah, maybe that has a little bit of it. I've heard that quite a lot actually. Yeah. Like often it's related to sport or yeah. even school. I was not that good, mm -hmm. but I wanted to be good, but I was not. So like I had to find another way. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, I, um, yeah. Yeah, and it's you know, I, it's uh, one of the characteristics I've seen. Like naturally, I, I gravitate to other people. It's other people who who you know played team sports mm -hmm. um, or really done anything that's like not just pure work where it involves like team leadership. Um, I find that you, especially for people who had the opportunity to do that growing up, you you find some of the best leaders who are hardest working and um, you know like just really committed to doing the right thing, working hard, being optimistic, like pushing through challenges, a lot of the values we really, a lot of characteristics we really value in the base world. You're a pretty technical person, right? Yeah. Usually, very technical people, I would say it's probably harder to be a good manager. Yeah. Because by definition, you're extremely focused and, you know, with some companies, they even develop specific roles for, the, for these people. A career path, instead of saying you're extremely good technically, uh, instead of just... Yeah, we have a, we have you a, as a manager, right? Individual um, contributor role. And exactly. We have a but base base. yet, you're yeah. the creator of base, yeah. right? And you're talking about yeah. being a team player. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always loved, I didn't, I've always loved technology. I didn't really realize that there was like code under the technology. Like I always watched the Apple keynotes, I jailbroke phones, I fixed screens, but I didn't realize there was code until my senior year of high school. And then I learned and I was like, oh, whoa, 
this is awesome. I can build. And I started building. I always loved building, mm. like trying to figure out how do I create something that other people want to use. And that kind of put me on the first, you know, while of my career where I did write a lot of code and I was very technical, but all of it was always in pursuit of an end goal, which was like create a valuable company or create a valuable product that people actually want to use. And what I found was I spiked very naturally on like product intuition and, and instincts and like technical architecture, like high level thinking about the systems that we were building. But a lot of the, t like the thing that really got me excited was like shipping and like getting things out the door and like learning from them. And I, I found that a lot of other people were just much better like raw engineers than me. Um, they were they, they were a more detail oriented. Uh, they were able to kind of like see things at certain times that I didn't see. Um, and I think I found a number of people who, who now I still work with, you know, this, this guy, Michael, who is kind of like the CTO of base, um, who ha who spike much more on that. They spike on these really deep technical insights. Um, and what's that, what that's kind of allowed me to do is lean into the stuff that I think I'm also really strong at, which is people. And it's like, mm -hmm. I love people. That's mm -hmm. another thing that has na come naturally to me always. Um, you know, a lot of it, I think through like the trial and fire of figuring out like, how do I be a leader even as a B player on the soccer team? <laughs> it's like, it took, took a lot of figuring out to do that. Um, but I think that that's given me the space to really lean into that kind of like people orientation and figuring out how to build healthy teams and build this mm -hmm. healthy ecosystem while still having really strong technical people around me who I can then kind of like work with and have them bring the ideas and like help me think about it while still having me remain involved, but not maybe always in the details. And so like if you look at a lot of the things that you know base has done you know whether it's smart wallets or you know our l2 like platform strategy with the op stack um i was i've been involved i'm involved in everything like any major technical thing we're doing i'm involved i have an opinion um and i often find that my intuitions are right um uh but i also find that like it the, the place i work best is at a high level where it's like thinking kind of strategically thinking about where do we want to go over the next one to two years figuring out how to like push people's boundaries and get them thinking outside of the box but then i also find that the, the people who are like the best engineers and we have an incredible group of them on base are so much better at like carrying it out and that gives me the space to go and do what i think i'm great at which is like bringing people together and coaching people and helping them be their best selves and helping them do incredible things so you're the creator of Base, you're a great manager, <laughs> you're a husband, yeah. you're also a crypto punk. Yeah, I'm a crypto punk, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. You own a crypto punk, why? Yeah. Uh, why do I own a crypto punk? I mean, I minted my crypto punk. Mm. So like, you know, they went open mint in 2017. I've, I've tried, you know, I, I actually don't have a vivid memory of doing it, but I've um, traced my, my time back and I minted it while I was on a flight. To Chicago from San Francisco. I was going somewhere in Chicago. And I I minted it and then I didn't actually look at it for like maybe three years. So like and then in 2020 I was um I was starting to get a little bit more visible. You know, at that point I was leading the consumer business at Coinbase um on the engineering side and I was starting to get a little bit more visible and I decided that just like for my own safety, I wanted to start not showing my face on the internet. Um, I didn't want to go anon, but I wanted to reduce the visibility of like what I look like so that I would just be less at risk for whatever. Mm -hmm. And I went through a bunch of different ideas. And then I kind of had this like inkling back in my head. I was like, oh, I remember that I had a CryptoPunk, but I like, I don't think it looked like me. And so like, and I, I had that in my head for a while, like that I had a CryptoPunk, but it didn't look like me. And so I was never going to use it. And then I was like, oh, I should go look at it just to make sure. And I looked at it and I was like, oh no, like literally, like at the time I had long hair, like I had a little vape that was a blue vape, you know, like I was, I was, little, I was, a, little, I was a little crazy. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, this is actually, I looked at it and I was like, this is me. Mm. And then I switched that to my profile photo. And now it's, you know, now it's been my, and, and I say it like that, more than any other thing that I own that is more part of who I am. Like I have like dysmorphia when I look at other pictures of myself. I'm like, that's not my, that's not me. <laughs> like that punk is me, you know, particularly online. And I do think it's had a, um, you know, I about the time I started base, maybe a little bit before I started base up until that point from like when I decided to use the punk to that point, I had been really strict. I didn't do any video and I didn't do any new photos. And I actually like proactively took all the photos of me offline. Mm. Um, 
And then once I realized I was going to do bass and I realized that so much of this was going to be connecting with people, I realized I couldn't hide my face. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's just so hard to connect with people when you do that. And so I started doing more video. I mean, here, here doing this video, but I still keep the punk. And what I found is that um, even though there is video, I mean, even though people can't find it because the thing that people look at every single day is the punk, mm. my overall like recognizability and visibility is still much lower. People don't always recognize me when I come up to them and say, hey, I'm Jesse, because people are used to looking at the punk. So mm. it's kind of like a mix of a, like a pseudon pseudonymity and um, also just like wanting to to show and wanting to be on chain. I mean, it's like, this is who I am on chain. Uh, it's just a little funny pixelated dude. So you cut your hair, right? Yeah, the I did cut my hair. Still has yeah. the long hair. Yeah, that was in January. That was January of this year. I had long hair uh, for almost 15 years. How long? Uh, it was, you know, it varied. Like I almost always wore it in like a up, like a bun that went mm -hmm. up here. Um, but it was like a little, like at times, like shoulder length or a little bit longer than shoulder length. Um, and then I, I, I did like an undercut where I shaved it off like two and a half years ago because I knew I was like getting ready to have short hair and then at the beginning of this year i pulled the trigger oh, those it feels feel great i love it i'm so glad i have short hair now it was a long time of long hair and i'm glad i had that time but it, it's nice it's so much easier to maintain and i just i like the way it looks and um you know it's kind of like this is a new i also got glasses and it's kind of a new um i don't know it feels like it's the next chapter for me so do you still vape <laughs> mm. I promise we're going to get into crypto soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, this is great. I do not smoke nicotine, but I do consume weed. So mm. that's the vaping that I that I have done and I still do. Um, and uh, I don't drink. I actually gave up drinking uh, two and a half years ago, and um, I never found drinking was uh, like particularly. It just like didn't make me feel very much. But I find that consuming weed, cannabis, whatever you want to call it um is a incredibly generative experience for me like it shifts my thinking in a really um fundamental way it can like basically like open up new pathways in in the way i think and so uh i find that like you know every once in a while doing that and going on a run or something like that where i can basically get endorphins and get uh my brain working in a different way if i do that i will open up like completely new ideas and be like oh like maybe this is how this thing could be solved that i'd missed for the last like month of thinking and so that's been a really useful tool for me at various points of time is there's a lot of stigma about weed that's so interesting I mean, even in the united states where it, it's not legal in the united states but it is legal in california I, I still think there's a lot of stigma um but it is a part of who i am and um it's funny because i have a blue vape Mm -hmm. that's like my little crypto punk that you know is the thing that when i when i do consume weed that's what i'll do so the weed kind of consumption is more is more something when okay i have a problem to solve and some people they sleep over it some people yeah. they do biohacking etc yeah. right you say okay i found something that works pretty well yeah i'll vape yeah. weed and then i'll go Run. Go on a run or do like a Peloton, you know, and just like get into zone two heart rate. And, um, you know, I think naturally, uh, like that, not always, right? Like mm -hmm. sometimes I'll just go on a run, you know, or like zone two, like that. I, I work out six to seven times a week as well. And, you know, that I go on a walk. There's a lot of different things I do to get ideas, but it's definitely a tool in the toolkit. Um, and I find that does open up my ways and open up my mind in new ways, which is really powerful and interesting. And it's not like the thing for me is like, you know, I think for a lot of people, weed is this thing where it's like, oh, I'm just going to like smoke weed and like, you know, hang out on the couch or do mm. nothing. And like, I can't like, that's not how it works for me. Like I smoke weed and it's like, oh my God, my brain is exploding with ideas. Like I would need to like write them all down. <laughs> it's, it's like a very so generative good. experience. <laughs> so good. You said it's a tool in the toolkit. Yeah. What are the other tools? Yeah, what are the other tools? Um, other tools, I mean, just like pure physical exercise, like zone two heart rate exercise, either a long run um, or a uh, like Peloton um, or even like a walk if I if I'm like have like a weight pack or something like that, rocking. Um, uh, like a walk with my wife or my close friends, like we'll go on a walk and we'll talk about something. I find that I have a lot easier time um, talking about things when um, I'm moving. Uh, Particularly, yeah, yeah, I have a lot easier time when I'm talking about things when I'm moving um, and just being like comfortable in my body. And then, I mean, I think just like finding, yeah, I think it's like finding time with like people who I work with really close. Yeah, I have a bunch of very close work relationships, um, uh, people at Coinbase and outside of Coinbase and just like finding a dedicated like 
hour plus long period of time with them to just like be generative and like talk about different ideas and like see what comes up and what emerges. Um, I think that's a, that's a big one. Yeah. Those are the ones that come to mind. Let's talk about crypto. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> Half an yeah, hour right. in, like yeah. 35 minutes in. How did you get so fascinated by the world of cryptocurrencies? How did I get so fascinated by crypto? Um, I, so I found out about crypto like my first year of college. So it was the spring of 2012. And I sat down at a table that was like this, it was a big circular table at my college uh, lunchroom, you know, sitting outside. And I sat down from this guy who was, you know, with a bunch of my friends. And he started telling me about how he was visiting and driving across the country and how he'd just written this white, uh, like his thesis in college about this thing called Bitcoin. I never heard about Bitcoin before. And um, I got to know him and learned about Bitcoin. And that, I was just like instantly pretty fascinated. Um, that guy was Olaf Carlson Wee, and he was mm-hmm. on his way to join Coinbase as the first employee. And we talked about that. And he was, he was actually like hanging out on campus for a week. And we got to know each other and he was friends with friends of mine. And um, so I kind of saw him go up and join Coinbase. And so that was my first introduction to Bitcoin. I read that white paper and I went home and bought Bitcoin on Coinbase. Like that was the beginning of 2012. So you understood directly when you read yeah, yeah. the white paper, it made sense to Yeah, you. it made that sense. Was- it was like, this is going to be a big deal. I don't know mm-hmm. exactly what it will be. It'll be a big deal. And then I started a company and we built kind of like a security software. It was like login software for businesses. And um, we were trying to trying to figure out what our like target customer was. And one of our theses was, you know, crypto businesses are places that have a high usability need because the technology is complex, but they also have a really high security need. Like, can we fit in that niche? And so in 2013, 2014, um, we predominantly sold to crypto companies. Um, and we actually, as a result of selling to crypto companies, built some like pretty cool crypto systems that weren't like currency related, but they kind of looked like pass keys. Um, but if a, a team of five people built them instead of Apple. Um, So they were a lot less sophisticated, but still did a lot of the same kind of overall technical architecture. Um, And then we we worked with folks like Bitfinex and BitMEX um, were customers of ours in 2013, 2014, 2015. Um, And they basically bought our login product, it was called Clef, and they installed it on their website and they, they let people log in with it. And so that was this time when I got like a much closer look into like, oh, here are our customers. I need to start going to crypto conferences. I need to start learning about like Ethereum. That's this thing that's coming out. Like all of that, um, just kind of exploratory work. And that over kind of like a four year period from 2013 to kind of like late 2016 um, was like just gradual incubation of my excitement about crypto. Um, And then, you know, I started buying Bitcoin every week. I started buying Ethereum every week um, when Ethereum came out. And then when that business ultimately like didn't work, we kind of had line of sight, it wasn't working. We did one pivot, it didn't work. We then realized, oh, we have six months left. Like, let's go through an aqua hire process. Mm-hmm. I called Olaf um, and I said, hey, Olaf, like, I'm really excited about crypto. You know, we have a great team that's been doing identity stuff. We've been selling to crypto companies. I tried to sell Brian. I had this whole like crazy email exchange in 2012 where it's like me trying to convince Brian to use our technology. But I was like, we should talk about us joining Coinbase. And we went and interviewed at Coinbase and did a whole process and uh, at a bunch of other places. And ultimately, three companies made an offer to acquire us, uh, Twilio, Okta, and Coinbase. Um, my whole team was really excited about continuing to work on identity and two-factor authentication. So they sold to Twilio. I was doing that. Um, but I was so excited about crypto and I kind of said, I don't want to, I don't want to go do that. Like I want to work on crypto. And so I, I originally thought that Coinbase offer was all or nothing. And so I spent a week trying to convince my team. I was like, you guys, like we should go work on the crypto thing, not the Twilio thing. And we got to the end of the week. It was Friday. I vividly remember this. And they were like, we're not, we really want to go to Twilio. And I was devastated. I was like crying being like, I, I'm, this is my dream. Like, I want to go do this. And then our CEO at the time, my co-founder, he called uh, Coinbase, Sam Rosenblum, who now is a partner at Han, um, and said, hey, like we're going to Twilio, but Jesse is still really excited about Coinbase. I'd love to find a way we can make that work. And Sam was like, tell him to just like sign and he can start. And so we ended up doing a little bit more negotiation, but um, I signed and I started. And then over the next two years, I actually recruited back uh, three of the people from my team. So a bunch of people came back to Coinbase and worked with us. And um, that was when I started working full time on crypto and I joined as an engineer and pretty much like the moment I joined, I took my, I took my bonus. I got like a signing bonus. I put it all into Ethereum. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, from the moment I joined, I was like, this is, 
this is it. Like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, or at least until, at least until we change the world. So. You are the very based creator of Baze. <laughs> what is Baze if you had to explain it to your mother? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the simplest way to think about Baze is that all of us use uh, phones and on our phones, we have these apps, you know, iPhone, Android. Um, but the problem with those apps is that um, you're going to have a uh, really uh, different and potentially negative experience depending on what kind of person you are. So if you're a developer and you're building one of those apps, uh, you're going to be building in a walled garden where you know 30% of all the revenue you make goes to a corporation. Mm. If you're a creator and you're using those apps, you're going to be putting your content onto those platforms and you're going to make less than 1% of the total revenue that those platforms make. And so your creativity goes to enrich those large corporations. Mm. And then if you're a user, you're, depending on where you're born or where you live, going to have different access to apps. If you have an Android phone, you can't access the iOS apps. If you have an iOS phone, you can't access the Android apps. If you aren't a United States citizen, you're not going to be able to access the United States financial products. And depending on where you're born or where you live, that's going to lead to massive disparities in what you actually have access to, the apps you have access to. And so what we're building with Base is a new global app store that is built so that uh, developers can build and uh, operate on an open platform where they make the money, where creators can put their content on chain and they make the money. And where anyone anywhere, regardless of who they are, regardless of where they're born, regardless of what phone they have, has access to the same apps. And we're still in the very early days of that app store, just like in the 2000, you know, early 2000s, it was the early days of mm -hmm. the iOS app store. But the potential for us building a global app store and a global economy that brings everyone in and that uh, puts everyone on a level playing field and gives them tools that let them do things with money and let them do things with um, uh, their creativity and let them do things with the way they're building businesses that make it 10 times faster, easier, and more accessible mm. to build and to create and to use. That is what BASE is. And that is the platform of on-chain and crypto and what the thing that BASE is a part of. Hey, when shift happens, family. Time to toast our partner, Divin. They're taking luxury wine to the blockchain with their super fun concept called Uncork to Earn. Buy your favorite wines, enjoy unique experiences, and get an airdrop each time you open a bottle with your friends. Cheers to Divin for bringing transparency, authenticity, and exclusivity to the fine wines industry. What's your base aha moment? Mm. Why did you launch Base and not any other business or project that you could yeah. have done in the space? Yeah, I mean, we went through four different ideas before we launched Base. Four. Yeah, yeah, four. Which um, one? <laughs> the first one I pitched uh, to our exec team in late 2021 was give me a billion dollars and 60 employees and I'll turn Coinbase into a DAO. That was the first one. Mm -hmm. um, they were like, no, like that's guessing. Get out of here. Try again. Um, then second one was kind of derivative of that, but a little different. The third one was uh, we built a kind of like uh, just like an app marketplace, which is kind of similar to what base. I mean, you'll see there's commonality, but we built this idea of like labeling different apps so that you could have kind of like an on-chain registry of all the different apps that existed. So then you could do other things with mm -hmm. that. Then we kind of realized, oh, in order to have a app store, we need identity. So we built a bunch of stuff around identity, which now actually just has kind of like re-emerged as base names. Uh, and then the, the third thing that we did was like, oh, maybe we can do like advertising on top of this identity and uh, marketplace stuff to help apps get more reach, um, which you, kind of looks like the on-chain content network. And I'd say the aha moment for base was we tried all of those things. And every single time we started building one of those things, we ran into the same problems, which were like, oh, we want to build this identity product on-chain. How do we make it work at the scale of Coinbase? Like to reach 100 million users? And how do we make it work really easily and intuitively with the Coinbase product suite? And at the time, like it couldn't. Mm. Even today, the products, you know, we're just getting to the point where everything works really well together. Um, but after seeing that kind of happen again and again and again and, and be the biggest blocker for us actually being able to move on these product things, we kind of had this aha moment um, after we launched an internal test net where we were like, okay, we're going to make it easier for developers at Coinbase to build on chain mm. by giving them a toolkit and giving them a place, we called it BaseNet, or originally it was called CoinNet, and then we changed it to BaseNet. And I think once we like connected that dot of like, oh, maybe we need a platform in order to enable these products, then it was like, boom, let's build a platform to make it easy for Coinbase to come on chain. And then if we're building a platform to make it easy for Coinbase to come on chain, 
let's build a platform to make it easy for everyone to come on chain. Mm. And that's base. And then the really, I think, powerful thing is we, you know, from the beginning, like we knew what it was in our hearts, but we didn't know where to start. We had this idea and we're like, oh, there's like this app store thing. It's like kind of there. It's like, oh, in order to app store, you need to have the identity. Like we're kind of feeling the different parts of the elephant. Um, if you know that, like whatever, it's like the blind man feels different mm -hmm. parts of the elephant. Mm -hmm. and they're all like, it's whatever. It's hard to tell from one, from the trunk or the foot or whatever it is. Um, and then I think once we had base, now we're almost speed running it, like the rest of the elephant. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, now we have base. Okay, great. Let's launch base names. Boom. Base mm -hmm. names live. Oh, apps are going to need names too. Like, let's get base names for apps so that apps can get base names so that we can help them label their contracts and give them rewards and, you know, do all these things that they need to do on chain in a trusted way. And we have apps. Well, what if we give them more distribution? That's the on chain content network. We can now give apps distribution across 30 million monthly active users. Like, that sort of um, kind of like building up from the ground, I feel like we kind of had to start at the top and we like worked our way down trying to figure out what it was and then we got to base and we're like okay now we have our platform and now we're gradually building our way back up until all of the systems are there and all of them work really well together and i think as those things kind of come together it's going to be this platform that the rest of the world can come on chain with um, and where you will have kind of like you know done the through line um, to figure out all the little bits and pieces and make them really tight and work seamlessly together and then everyone else is going to benefit from that kind of like smooth seamless uh easy to use experience uh, that we're going to pave so it makes a lot of sense actually what you're saying which is like we use coinbase first yeah as a kind of test and then we go outside yeah, right exactly but there's one thing i thought about which probably if i think about it there's many other people who think about it which is is there not something sort of paradoxical in Coinbase, a Nasdaq listed and fully regulated company launching or at least being associated to the launch of a platform to scale Ethereum, mm -hmm. which is the worst decentralized supercomputer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't know if ironic is the right word, but I par do, paradoxical. paradoxical. I, I don't even know if paradoxical is the right word. I do think that there's uh, a, an inherent tension, mm -hmm. though, in that, which is that you do have a large... Uh, kind of like centralized off-chain legacy company, mm. um, which of course is a crypto company, but if you look at the business that has predominantly made Coinbase successful, it's you know a centralized business that's custodial, that's regulated, that um, uh, you know happens predominantly off-chain. Um, that thing kind of incubating and launching a decentralized L2. Now, that is the stated uh, roadmap of Ethereum, right? Like Ethereum's like, we're going to scale through L2s. And one of the ways that's going to happen is you're going to have a lot of different players who come in and kind of open these platforms. But there is still that tension between, oh, decentralization and L2 and open and permissionless environment, and then kind of like centralization and kind of corporations and, and the traditional. And I, I was actually DMing with something about this on uh, Warpcast the other day. They asked me, "Is like, what do I think about that?" And what I think about it is that it's it's the greatest strength and it's the greatest risk. Mm -hmm. You know, like the greatest strength because you have a this incredible first customer where it's like if you can solve the problems that Coinbase, as a four thousand person public company, has on chain, that's a really good playbook for then going and solving it for like every other Fortune five hundred company. Uh, and if you can leverage the distribution and the the like efficiency and the scale and the resources of Coinbase. That's a really powerful platform for aggressively growing and kind of proliferating this new way of building. Mm -hmm. And so huge strengths that kind of sit there. On the flip side, if you get lost in the sauce of centralization and you uh, re like think about this thing, oh no, this is just, it's just a centralized product, mm -hmm. then you actually, I think, miss out on the upside, which is building an open global on-chain economy. Because an open global on-chain economy is not going to be controlled by one company. It's mm -hmm. not going to be controlled by one country. It has to be decentralized because that's the only way you can actually get the level of neutrality in the system that would make it so every country could participate. And so every corporation could participate. And every person, regardless of where mm -hmm. they're born, could participate. And so I think there's a, 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 there will be a natural inclination with things that look like this to almost get to a local maxima, which is like, if we think about this thing as a traditional product offering from a corporation, what's the best we could do? And I think the exercise with base and the exercise with managing the strength and risk is figuring out how do you not get sucked into that local maxima? And how do you instead strive for the global maxima, which is a global economy, which has to be built on a decentralized platform? And I think what is going to be uh, inherent in that is a loss of control and a mm -hmm. loss of centralization, a lack of centralization. And I think really, you know, this goes back to one of the, the questions you 
you had earlier, but like the only reason I think that this is even remotely possible is because we're doing an incubating base inside of a company with the founder CEO who's believed in crypto from the very beginning of crypto. Mm. Because on the day we launched the base testnet, I got a message from Brian Armstrong at 11.50 p.m. And he's like, hey, Jesse, great job. Three things. First off, like you haven't even shipped the main net. So like, don't get too ahead of yourself. Like go and deliver value. Like you have to serve customers. And the second second thing is, you have to decentralize because if we do not decentralize this thing, all of this will be for naught and we will have wasted our time and energy and we will have brought kind of like the, the worst parts of what we're trying to um, uh, solve for with all of our work into the thing that we ourselves are building. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of leadership and that sort of messaging from the top uh, combined with, I think, the, the belief and conviction and commitment that we've had from the beginning um, on base around building as an Ethereum L2 so we could bootstrap off Ethereum's decentralization from building on the OP stack so every single contribution we make is open source and anyone can benefit from it. Um, all of that then combines to at least give us a shot, and I think a very good shot at actually being able to kind of pull this thing off and balance those strengths with the risk and make sure we actually get to the decentralized endgame. That's so interesting. And the other day I was talking with the co-founder of Sui. Mm -hmm. so it's basically ex-Facebook people yeah. who built Libra, right? Yeah. That didn't work out. And one of the main reasons it didn't work out is because people were not trusting them because Facebook data, totally. right? Totally. And so in that case is people are saying, hey, ethos of crypto, decentralization, Coinbase, centralization, we don't trust you, yeah, right. Yeah, we don't trust you. But like that's why it's so important to make this message that you said, right, from yeah. Ryan, much more kind of out there. Totally. Hey, since day one, but the, the the first reflex you might have, even that I have naturally yeah. myself, right, without being too close to the matter, it's yeah, do I trust them to have yeah. the best intention for the for totally. the industry? Totally, yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's the thing we we like uh, actions will speak louder than yeah. words, right? Yeah. And if you look at our actions thus far. We have, you know, explicitly said we're going to be decentralized, and then we've delivered milestones, you know, every quarter since then, since the beginning of the launch. We just launched fault proofs on testnet. Um, that's going to be going live soon. The Security Council making progress on multi proofs in stage two, and um, there's a lot more work. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, you know, we're just going to let our words. I mean, we're just going to let our actions speak for themselves, and we're just going to keep telling people this is the plan, and then delivering on the plan. What's your biggest criticism of the base ecosystem today? Biggest criticism of the base ecosystem today? Hmm. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's a criticism of the base ecosystem, but as I thought about kind of like, what do I want to see from base builders as we head into the second half of this year? There's really like three things. The first is like, I think in crypto a lot, people can get kind of lost in the sauce and we just need to focus on building things that people want, actually. You know, like if we were a normal company going through Y Combinator, like that would be the first thing that all of us were drilling into our heads. It's mm -hmm. like build something people want and talk to customers and make sure they actually want it. But I think in crypto, we can sometimes just get so kind of confused by the economic incentives and the, the tokens and the, you know, like game theory and all these things. And we can lose sight of the fact that like we have to build something people want. And so mm -hmm. that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is we have to make it really freaking easy to use. And I think historically we've had kind of this mindset of, oh, this is good for crypto. But if we're really talking about building a new global on-chain economy, like the next generation of the internet, it can't just be good for crypto. It has to be like better than every online product that exists today. Otherwise people aren't gonna switch to it. Absolutely. And so we finally have the infrastructure that can enable us to do that. There's still pieces that we need to put together to finalize it, but smart wallets plus base names plus L2s, like you have this package that can let people build really powerful consumer products. And now we need to like leverage that pack, pra, uh, package, refine it further and just deliver the best products period. And then the, the third thing is, I think that like each of us has a like almost like a moral responsibility to take time out of our day every week or every month to go bring new people on chain. And like do the work ourselves, almost like missionary work of telling people about this new economy and telling people about how it's going to upgrade these systems that are broken. Because I think, A, like that's how we do it. Like literally, it's a viral thing. You know, we, we have to go get people on chain, otherwise, no one's ever gonna get on chain. But then B, through that work of um, telling people and through that work of explaining to them and practicing, how do I communicate this to my mom? Or how do I communicate this to my grandparents or whatever? Like you learn so much about, are you building something people want? And is it really easy to use? 
And that's like the only way we're going to make good enough products that this actually works. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm saying those three things, you know, I guess maybe it is a criticism, not, not because we're not doing it like, you know, we're doing a horrible job. I think Base is actually probably doing a pretty good job relative to the broader ecosystem on this stuff. But in order for us to build a global economy that like, brings billions of people on chain like it can't just be like oh this is like pretty good you know yeah. it has to be like no we did this better than anyone else like we yeah. made things people want better than anything else we made it easier to use than anything else and we made it so that we actually hustled our butts off to go and get everyone in the world to use it and so that's what i want to see very refreshing to hear actually yeah and someone very practical like that uh i'm kind of smiling because the next two or three themes are exactly what you mentioned. So we'll <laughs> go deep into that. But first, regarding Bayes still, I saw this crazy chart the other day from Token Terminal. Bayes is literally running away from the rest of the layer twos. So you are, you said, right, uh, I'm kind of have this criticism, but you guys are growing so fast. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. Um, well, first off, like I will just say about all the data, like I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of charts that people share and there's a lot of spam and weird activity that happens on chain. Mm. And so what we are focused on is building great products. Mm. And we try not to get lost in the noise or the sauce or the hype around how great we're doing. Like, I don't care. It is still day one. When you look at these charts and you look at the scale of what we need to do to bring the world on chain, like we're not even 0.1% of the way there. Literally, we have to do 10,000 X to get to the scale of the internet today. Mm. And so I'm like, I'm not that interested in the comparisons to other L2s. I'm not that interested in the idea of us competing with other L2s. What I'm interested in is competing with online and making it so on chain is 10 X better, 100 X better than online, and then bringing all the wor world's users into this new on chain economy. And so that's kind of the starting point. Now, I think in terms of what's working on base right now, um, I do think it goes back to some of the themes I was just talking about. Like we have said from the beginning, we're not going to get caught up in, you know, playing games, doing incentives, like making things that uh, distract from our focus, which is building products that people want. Whether it's us building a great developer platform that developers want because it's the easiest thing to use and gives them the most powerful tools for building these new on-chain apps, or it's us supporting apps that are not doing crazy incentive games to you know pump token price or whatever, but instead are just building great products that solve real problems for everyday people or businesses. Like that has been the focus from the beginning. And we've set up systems, both like social systems and incentive systems and reward systems that reward that behavior. You know, we have this meme of like build and you will be rewarded. We have this meme of like stay based, which is like working hard and being optimistic and pushing boundaries with the creativity. We have these three things of building something people want and um, uh, making it really easy to use and onboarding new people. Like all of that is almost like a, a, a cultural definition that we are collectively doing as an ecosystem to center us on what matters, which is just putting in an ungodly amount of hard work over the next decade or few years or whatever, however long it's going to take to make incredible products that everyday people love and that bring the world on chain. And I think that that's gone through to the builders in the base ecosystem. And I think it's led to some pretty incredible products coming out of the base ecosystem um, that people actually want to use. And then that has its own knock-on effects about people using the platform and you know there being more activity and um, it being a place that people actually want to come and spend their lives. And um, yeah, that's what it's all about. You mentioned the incentives and you kind of mentioned tokens, right? So instead of asking the classic when token question, let's be yeah. practical and critical about tokens. Yeah. I saw a tweet the other day uh, by Kato AI mm -hmm. saying, Bayes is, abs is absolutely cooking. Arguably, the highest growth projects are Bayes, Polymarket, Pum.fun, and none of them have a token. Yeah. Do you think that the three fastest growing crypto projects not having a token is just a coincidence? I don't think it's a coincidence. Mm. Um, I think, I mean, I said it, I think that, that 
tokens um like i first off i I think that tokens and like uh crypto like on-chain governance structures are going to be incredibly powerful tools like from first principles what we're seeing happen is you have the historical way of organizing human beings and organizing uh human beings working together that has been defined in like legalese written by lawyers it's incredibly slow it's incredibly expensive it's incredibly hard to change and what's happening now is we're building new systems in software on chain that let us do the same things like a thousand times more efficiently. Mm-hmm. And that's leading to DAOs and tokens. And there's a lot of failures and a lot of mistakes and a lot of learnings. But over time, that is going to uh, lead to massive efficiency gains. And those are going to be uh, way, way outperforming traditional organizations, even if they have a lot of the same shared structures over time. So that's first principles thinking. Incredibly important innovation. Lots of um, uh, growth and upside that will come from it. Now, I think one of the most like perverse and negative things that's happened on chain over the last five years is that people have put the token ahead of the product and they've said, oh, the first thing we're going to do is launch a token or we're going to launch a product. And then like, even if we don't have product market fit, we're going to launch a token. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like if you analogize it and obviously tokens are different than, than equity and all these things, but like if you analogize this to a, um, you know, like early stage startup being like, we're going to launch product. And then like a few months after we launch our product, even though we don't have product market fit, we're going to go public and get public shareholders who are going to like breathe down our necks and like have public governance where people are going to be able to participate and have a public price that every single one of our employees is looking at and like deciding their worth on whether it's going up or down. I mean, like literally it's incredibly toxic and incredibly uh, like, uh, negative for actually making great products. Mm, absolutely. And so I think when you're looking at these products like Polymarket or Base and you're seeing, oh, like they don't have a token yet and they're still being successful, I think it's almost like a proof of that, right? It's like if you ignore the token noise and you say, we're actually just going to focus on building the best freaking product. And sometimes it's going to take years. I mean, Polymarket has been working for five years and Base, you know, have been working for two years, but like it's going to take years. Just like starting a company it, it takes 10 years. That's like it. almost all companies are like the average time is 10 years before you go public or get any exit. Like that focus and rigor and relentlessness of like, we're just going to do the hard work to make this product great. I think that that's what leads to good products. And it's what leads to making the right decisions. And it leads to not getting distracted by all this free money, which is not free money. It's actually really expensive money yeah, because you pay in your distraction and you pay in dilution, you pay in all these different factors. And so I, um, yeah, again, I think this is an incredible innovation, but the industry has gotten just too caught up in it. And if we all just go back to basics and we think from first principles, but like, what's it going to take to build products? Like we're going to be so much better. And I think we're going to see so many more successful products. And then, of course, we can figure out, okay, now that we have a ton of great products, how do those products use these new technologies and tokens and governance to do great things? But that should be like, that should be like a step. That's the next step. (laughs) First, we got to build the great products. But I could even argue that if you are there, you have a great product or a set of great products that actually are generating you cash, right? And profits. Why would you even launch a token? I mean, I think it's, I think it depends on how you think about it, right? Like, A, I think there are going to be on-chain structures that basically let you, like, take a traditional corporation and restructure it on-chain and have all of the structuring of it on-chain, the governance of it on-chain. It'll just be way, way more efficient. It's going to be cheaper. It's going to be faster. It's going to be easier. It's going to be more global. And so I think that's one thing. I also think that we're seeing really innovative, like, new models emerge, like the Duna in Wyoming. I don't know if you followed the Duna, but it's a new legal framework that um, folks have been working on in, in Wyoming that's a, a decentralized, unincorporated uh, non, nonprofit association that basically lets you do things like um, have fully on-chain governance um, with an entity that can do like uh, with staking, do like uh, cash dividends uh, and still have that thing kind of like governed in pursuit of like an overall mission that's defined in the Duna. And like, that's a really interesting new concept. And I think it could apply really nicely to some of the networks that we're seeing emerge where they do have this kind of like, you know, mission that's, you know, like kind of a nonprofit mission, but they also have cash flows and you want to be able to let people participate in order to earn cash flows. And so I think a lot of the kind of like distortion around tokens right now is a driven by like 
people just getting fixated on money because that's what humans do, mm -hmm. but then be driven by a lack of regulatory clarity in the United States and beyond, where we basically said, we do not like, we're going to apply these frameworks from the 1930s to this massive technology shift and transformation in how we can build people systems and economic systems. And that's like pushed us to these really weird shapes and edges that like distort what we're actually trying to do and have us optimizing for regulatory instead of actually like what's going to get the right governance outcomes. And that's led to this like those two things have led to like a world where you just don't have that many good models. But I think that's going to change. I think we're getting into a much better place regulatorily globally and in the United States, slowly but surely. Um, I think we're seeing people try and learn and fa like fail and learn. And that's giving us a lot more data. And then I do think we're seeing kind of the reemergence of a set of really principled founders who are saying like we're just going to build great freaking products mm. on chain and like we need more of those people and my gut tells me that over the next few years we're going to see this convergence where you will have the regulatory stuff clarify you will have kind of the noise get sufficiently like clear to everyone that it's toxic and bad and then you will have this kind of founder group that has done it the right way where they've said, we're going to build great products and we're going to spend years building those great products. And then at some point later this decade, we're going to get to the point where it's like, boom, now all the regu re regulatory stuff is really clear. We have a bunch of really incredible products and we've learned all of the stuff that doesn't work. Now what do we do? And then we're just going to cook. Mm -hmm. And like, these systems are going to work so well. And so I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I do feel like we're kind of entering this next era of crypto that's going to look a lot more rational and principled and is going to reward the people who are rigorous about how do we just focus on building great products focusing on building great products and explaining the value proposition yeah to the world right yeah i recorded the conversation uh, on friday with hunter horsley yeah put us in touch love hunter and he said exactly that, right? He said that he was actually very annoyed and frustrated with the crypto space today because we are extremely bad at communicating our value proposition to the real world, Yeah. right? He said there is a few companies, Coinbase is one of them, right? Doing incredible work at simplifying everything. Yeah. And you're actually sharing very regularly videos yeah. of, yeah. I even saw one uh, um, with the liquid death, right? Yeah. Like yeah, there is yeah. all these kind of like very simplistic video to explain to people, hey, what is this thing, yeah. right? But most of the people in crypto don't understand that that's so important, yeah, right? So important. And so Hunter said, we should be able to answer the following three questions, or we'll never truly see crypto go mainstream. So let me let me ask you those three questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you kind of mentioned some of them yeah, before. Yeah, I put on some, but we'll see what he says. How is crypto good for humanity? Crypto is good for humanity because we have a bunch of legacy systems that are tens or hundreds of years old that are incredibly inefficient, incredibly expensive, and incredibly slow. Mm. And they make it incredibly painful for everyday people to manage their money. They make it unfair for creators who bring so much value into the world and aren't rewarded for it. And they make it hard for small businesses and other entrepreneurs to do their best work in their businesses. And crypto gives us an opportunity to build a new next generation of the internet that's going to upgrade all of those systems and make it so uh, those everyday people have access to best in class financial services, regardless of where they live, that creators get to put their creativity on a platform that actually gives them the value and lets them own it long term. And that small businesses and entrepreneurs have the tools that let them build generational businesses at 10x cheaper, 10x faster, in a 10x better way. And if that isn't good for humanity, <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you, but it's a, pretty, it sounds, it's a pretty it incredible good. moment, right? And just like we saw the internet transform the world in the early 2000s, as we went from offline to online, we are in the in middle of the next transformation as we go from online to on-chain. And it's going to lead to massive increases in innovation and creativity and freedom. And it's just going to take a lot of hard work from all of us to actually make it happen. Great. Okay, one down. Second question. Next. How can my mom benefit from crypto? I mean, it depends who your mom is. But some ways, my, my mom loves crypto now. She loves it. She has her wallet. She uh, mints things on chain. She loves create collecting. Um, but some ways that I've seen my mom uh, benefit. One is like 
a lot of moms love art and creativity and now there's a lot of art and creativity on chain. And so getting Zora or Rodeo and figuring out, hey, is there content here that I'm interested in? And then minting to directly support those creators with micropayments, super easy. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of moms love food. Uh, there's a great new app called Blackbird, uh, which is in 400 restaurants in New York and expanding around the country. I use um, it in New York, actually. You use, use it in yeah. New York, yeah, there. You can go, you can get a better dining experience where you tap check-in, you can uh, pay whenever you want, you can pay with crypto, and you're not only going to have a great dining experience, but you're going to actually have a better experience for the restaurant because they're going to pay lower fees and they're going to have a better margin, which lets them operate more successfully. Yeah. Uh, another way your mom could use uh, crypto, maybe your mom doesn't live in the same country as you. And it's probably a pain in the butt for you to send money to your mom or your mom to send money to you or your mom to send money to your friends or your mom to get money when she's traveling. And on chain with crypto, you can have global free payment rails that connect you instantly to your mom or your friends or your family, regardless of where they are. And it, it's literally instant and it's literally free. And that is incredibly different than the normal, oh, you got to pay someone in the Europe from the United States. That's going to take three to five days. It's going to cost $35. Uh, if you're paying someone from uh, Mexico to the United States, the average remittance cost is $45. $45. If you are an average American who moved to this country with family outside of the country and you are working a minimum wage job where you're earning $8.50 an hour, 8.50 an hour, and yeah. you work 40 hours a week, yeah. and you want to send some of that money back to your family, and then you have to pay $42 to send that money to your family. I mean, what is crypto good for? We're oh. building new systems that serve the people. Mm. I mean, I get fired up talking about it. Like I, it's, I love it. I can't feel the... <laughs> I'm like, come on! <laughs> How do I use crypto? How do you use crypto? Uh, you can go to wallet.coinbase.com. That'll get you a wallet in less than five seconds. You put in your biometric. Uh, you can use that wallet to send money to anyone in the world. You can use that money to mint creativity on chain. You can use that wallet to um, go to your local coffee shop and buy coffee. There's now tens of restaurant uh, coffee shops in the United States and globally that are starting to accept USDC because instead of paying 3% in fees, 3%, mm. which for the average small business, their margin, their entire margin is 3%. Yeah. And right now they pay 3% in fees. So if you got rid of those fees, you could double their margin. With USDC, you can accept USDC for free. Mm. You can go to acceptusdc.com. If you're a small business, if you're a coffee shop owner, you can go to acceptusdc.com and we will help you accept USDC for free. And then if you're an everyday person, you can go to your favorite coffee shop and you can pay with USDC. The energy in the room is pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do bring a lot of energy. It's one of the things that I, uh, yeah, I have a lot of energy. I love it. Brings us to the next uh, topic, optimism. Yeah. Optimism is a moral duty. These are the words. I love that. Brian just tweeting bangers on a Sunday. Right? These, are, these are the words from Brian Armstrong, the founder, CEO of Coinbase. <laughs> yeah. How can someone cultivate optimism, especially in an industry like crypto where people either beca become cynical and leave because they got too wrecked yeah. or stay but become cynical optimists. So they're only half, half, half optimists, right? Because they got very wrecked, but just not enough to leave. <laughs> Maybe they love the pain, right? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think that like the best thing, <laughs> crypto specifically, probably the best thing you can do for being an optimist is like not focus your time and attention on trading. Mm. Like if you focus your time and attention on trading, you're in a PVP game where almost certainly you're going to lose in some major way. Like it's, it, it, it's bad for your mental health. Like and, and that's not to say that people don't love trading and it's not a great thing. But like for most people, it's not going to be positive EV for you economically. And you're, it's going to suck up so much of your mind share because you're going to be looking at these price charts that you have no control over. And so I think the biggest thing that I think in crypto, a lot of people I would like to see and that could shift people towards optimism is figuring out what you can control yeah. and figuring out what's going to be the way that you make an impact on the world. How do you find that kind of sphere of influence? And then how do you just put your head down and make progress every day? And what I found is that if you can build a habit of being able to make progress, even if it's small progress, even if it's just building your following or you know making your product incrementally better, that habit is something that can then kind of like turn into optimism. Mm -hmm. Because if you see, oh, over the last week I made X progress and over the last month I made X progress, then you can kind of extrapolate that out and you can say, whoa, 
look at how far I'll be in a year. Look at where I was a year ago. Mm. And look how far we've come since then. And that kind of like uh, relative perspective, I think that is a thing that then grounds you in, oh, we can make change. And um, we can make the world a better place. We can change the small thing. And if we can change the small thing, it can change a bigger thing and then it can change an even bigger thing. And so finding that thing that you really love and care about, and then also that it's actually in your sphere of influence and focusing your attention on that so you can make an impact, it's probably the, the most important thing you can do. Especially in crypto. I was talking today with a friend of mine who um, is now just got accepted in the accelerator of uh, yeah. Third Web. Yeah. And he was like, I'm talking to the founder CEO. It's crazy how... If you're trying to build something, you can talk to anyone. Yeah. And I was like, of course, man. Like, of course. That's the beauty of crypto. Yeah. And that's what motivates you a lot, totally. right? You're like, in, in the other kind of web to world, much harder, right? Like, totally. You're not going to talk to Mark Zuckerberg. But like in crypto, yeah. if you're trying to contribute and people feel that you're here for the right reason, which is build and not just trade or be a kind yeah. of parasite of the yeah. market, yeah. You, people will yeah. welcome you with open arms and totally. you're going to feel like, holy shit, like I... I'm part of that. Right? I'm part of it. Yeah. I mean, this is, look, I get hundreds of DMs every day and I try and reply to as many of them as I can. Um, I try, I actually reply to almost all of them, but the ones that I spend the most attention on are the ones where people are building things. Mm. And if you can in like 240 characters be like, here's what I'm building. Here's the progress we've made, the impact that we've had, and here's how we need some help. As long as that thing that's help is like remotely within my control or I could like get someone else to help you with it, I'm going to do it. Mm. Because if you're building something on chain right now and you're really bringing a builder mindset, like I want you to be successful mm. and I'm willing to take my time and energy to help you be successful. Now that's very different. I get a lot of other messages that's like, this meme price went down <laughs> or like, you know, this, like, why did you blah, 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 you know, like, can the dev do something? Yeah. Can the dev do something? I'm like, <laughs> I'm not interested. I'm not going to reply. Like, that's not a good use of my time. And it's probably not a good use of your time either. Like if, yeah. if, if you're fixated on the pure prices of things, you should ask yourself, like, what can you build that will make an impact? Yet people's emotion are completely following yeah, it's prices, crazy. right? Crazy. Completely. You tweeted a month ago, people were saying Bayes was dead. Now the same people are saying Bayes is the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> Remember, it's never as bad as it seems and it's never as good as it seems. We put our heads down, keep building and stay based. Always. Always. In crypto, we go from it's over to we are so back every week, right? Yeah. And it's always linked to the prices. Yeah. How do you deal with the crazy emotional roller coaster that is inevitable when you build a project in this space? Yeah, well, if that was the first time I've, I've heard someone read that tweet out loud, and I love, I didn't realize it, but I loved that I rhymed uh, dead and bread. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's great. Um, it's great. But uh, I mean, that that quote is a that's a Brianism. Like that came that came from Brian. Like he sent that email to the company. Like you know, I've been through three, I think three bull markets or two and a half bull markets at Coinbase, and I feel like at some point in every like the peak of every bull market and the bottom of every bear market, Brian sends an email to the company that's like, "Hey guys, it's never as good as it seems. It's never as bad as it seems." Mm -hmm. like, every six months, <laughs> like just reminds us, you know, like share price down, share price up, never as good as it seems, never as bad as it seems. And I think that that, I mean, it goes back to what we were just talking about. It's the builder mindset, like particularly when it comes to prices, it's not in our control and it's not going to matter on the long, long term. Mm -hmm. What matters is are we building products that make a difference, that serve our customers, that make the world a better place, that make people's lives easier. Um, and if we get wrapped around these like volatility movements, if we get distracted by it, it's not going to help us build the best products. And so just regrounding ourselves and doing that, like, you know, almost a little bit of stoicism where it's just like, don't get lost in the yeah. sauce. It's the third time I've said that. I'm realizing this probably but, like, just don't get lost. Right. It's so easy to get distracted. And if you can figure out how to tune that out and tune into Am I making the right decisions today that can help me make my product better? Am I focused on the right things? Like, am I doing the hard work? Am I really making an impact? It's just gonna, it's gonna feel so much better. And you're gonna not be nearly as like volatile emotionally, mm. which is also just gonna feel way better.
and you're applying that to business, but it's very, it's the same in life, right? Same in life. You yeah. have the life pendulum. Sometimes yeah. you really feel like shit, but like yeah. if you feel like shit, probably you're going to feel better yeah. in the future. If you feel amazing, probably you're going to feel less good, <laughs> yeah. right? So yeah, it's, that's how life works. That's how life works. Yeah. And it's just about like, how do you stay even keeled and calm and present and, you know, just kind of treat every moment as just a little special snowflake, you know, of like this is this moment and then maybe it feels really euphoric, but it's just another moment in long life. What's the toughest moment you've ever experienced in your life? <laughs> wow. That was a hard transition. The toughest moment I've ever experienced in my entire life. Huh. Um... Um, I mean, there's a lot of, there's some personal ones, um, which maybe I'm not going to share, but I would say, I mean, the mo the one that comes most recently to memory, um, is, is like work and personal related, but last summer, so literally right as we were launching base, um, I, I mean, the like, so first off, the first year of building base from 21 to 2022, it's really challenging. It's like, we, we wasn't building base. We were trying to figure out what we were doing. And I was meeting with, you know, Brian, CEO and chief product officer, like every other week. And they were like, so do you have the innovative new thing? And I was like, I, you know, like in like creating like slide decks <laughs> Sunday night, like for my Monday meeting being like, I need to put something <laughs> like what, like, I don't have it figured out. I you didn't, know? I didn't smoke <laughs> enough weed to. <laughs> To have, to have the clarity <laughs> moment yeah, 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 to smoke okay. more. <laughs> no, no, not that. But I was like, you know, it was literally, it was literally a year of like, um, it was like a year of, of being like, I don't know what the frick I'm doing. Like, I don't have the answers. And these people think I'm going to have the answers and I don't have the answers. And I keep trying things and they keep failing. And they shut down the team. So that was really bad. I was very anxious. For the is it time. not what, is this not what entrepreneurship is? I mean, it was, People yeah. think that you have things figured out, but yeah, you're like no, trying totally. to make something happen, right? Totally. And at some point, you're trying to build the momentum of yeah. something. And at some point it starts and then, but yeah. like people don't realize how much yeah. even the best entrepreneurs ha don't have everything figured out, right? Totally, totally. Yeah, and so, so that was the first year of base. And then I kind of like found base. And I was like, oh, now I know what we need to build. Like, you know, clips. Like once we had the first prototype internally, it was like, Oh, I see it. Like, I see that this can be a really big deal. But then from late 2022 to, to when we launched the mainnet in August of last year, I, that was probably like the most like anxious, stressed period of my life. Um, and I also, I don't think I've ever worked harder in my life because I felt like we were on a really fast clock. Like I really wanted to get this thing out into the world because mm -hmm. it felt like I just saw it all happening. And I was like, I want to be there. But then also there's something about launching something like base where it's a multi-sided marketplace, like an ecosystem where you kind of, what you're getting, like you need to get the flywheel spinning, mm -hmm. right? Like you need the momentum to get going. And that's not something that like you can, like I could just do, like I, could, I didn't have the inputs. Instead I needed like, dependencies like I, I needed all the different apps to come i need the infrastructure for them and i needed like coinbase to do the right integrations and i really felt like for like from when we started building in november to august um I was working really really hard i really wanted this to be successful and i felt like i was like trying to almost like bear hug all of the pieces that needed to be in it and like it's almost like throwing a party like you throw a party and you're like you invite all your friends mm -hmm. and then like the night before i get incredible host anxiety um you're like is anyone gonna come is it gonna be a fun party and i felt that for like nine months and for throughout like as the intensity of that started increasing and as um i started working harder and harder particularly as we got into summer um and we like triangulated on dates like I stopped eating. I was nauseous all the time. I was anxious. I lost like 15, 20 pounds. Mm. Um, like I couldn't concentrate on other things. Like I was finding that I was being really like pessimistic and negative. And we launched base and, you know, beginning of August and like 10 days, 15 days after we launched base, I was still kind of in the same place as my wife. We were, we were going on a vacation to be with my family and we were driving it was a long drive my wife was kind of like we, we were talking about other stuff but my wife was 
she was kind of, like she kind of basically had an intervention for me. She was like, "Look, like this isn't okay. It's not working for you. You're not okay. You're not healthy. Um, it's not working for me. Like <laughs> this is not okay. <laughs> like you're not present. Like mm-hmm. you're not doing this." And that was a real wake up call for me. Like I was not, I wasn't okay. And so I kind of got through on train summer that August, and I took a week off. Um, and I like had to do kind of a reset for myself. You know, I like started going to a therapist again i started um uh you know like meditating and doing a bunch of other things you know working out more um uh and i gradually got got like you know i'm doing a lot better i'm doing good right now but it was it was this interesting contrast of a like we launched and it was a super successful launch but like for me as a leader and then i was it was the worst i've ever felt in my entire Mm. life and I was like waking up every morning being like, I don't know how I'm gonna get through the day. Of, like, how do I feed myself to not feel like I'm gonna pass out? You know, there's day like wow. there's literally days during that where I was like, I would get off a meeting and I would go and curl up on a on my couch, like in a ball, because I was so nauseous I couldn't eat anything and I couldn't do anything other than just like lie there and try and sleep. So I didn't feel what I was feeling. And I don't know, having that having that like contrast between like everyone else being like, this is so awesome. And then me being in it and being like, this is so awesome. And like trying to be positive Jesse and like exude energy and all these things. Well, like inside I was like, I'm done. Like, I don't know if I can make it. Yeah. That was, I mean, in recent memory, that's definitely the hardest. That's the hardest thing. So you were telling me about this uh, moment where everything was doing great on the outside, but yeah. from the inside you were kind of, I mean, it's pretty much the definition of burnout, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, have you ever felt, like giving up? Um, I mean, I think at that point in time, I mean, I needed that wake up call for my wife and I'm glad, I'm glad she did it. And it was very helpful. And I feel, I mean, I feel so much better. I'm so happy today versus nine months ago, whenever, I guess a year ago now. Um, but even during that period of time, there was definitely parts of me where I was like, I don't know if I can do this anymore, mm. but it wasn't like, I'm going to, I want to give up versus like a year prior. Like when we were in the idea phase, I, th- I thought about quit. I mean, I had to get talked off the ledge of quitting like by my wife and by some colleagues that I work with. I'm just like, I don't know if I can do this. And I just don't know if it's worth it. Like it's so, like, especially in the early days where you're just trying to find product market fit and in that context like it it wasn't even like i someone gave me an investment and then i had to give like a board meeting every quarter or something like that Mm -hmm. it was like no i was meeting with like public company exec team every other week Mm -hmm. reporting on like had i innovated the thing yet and that was just like such not a good environment it eventually got to the right outcome but that was really an environment where i was like i just don't know if i can do this i don't know how long i can do this um so that was probably the closest i felt like giving up but I don't know. I'm pretty resilient. I'm pretty resilient, motherfucker. Like, you, like you, 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 you're not gonna it, like this. It, it's pretty. It runs pretty deep. Um, I, I work really hard. I really believe in myself. I really believe what we're doing in what we're doing with base and in, with crypto. And I'm kind of like, I'm just gonna give this everything I possibly can. Yeah within the confines of you know being a good partner and you know being good human being so mm. i think it's amazing that you're opening up, up like that and i th- because most people might not think about it but everybody's a human right yeah and everybody's struggling especially in the beginning of a company it's so hard and i think people underestimate how hard it is and even how the very successful people went through all these moments it's yeah. normal like, yeah. right to doubt and um, as I was telling you before, right, uh, you opened up about a few like really key things. I had the, the Jason from Blockworks yeah. opening up about, yeah. you know, again, like they raised, uh, he said, oh, we raised 12 million. It's not that much, but valuation, whatever, one, 130 million. And they're seen as one of the big, big media empires in crypto, probably going to get much bigger. But he's like, hey, man, I have this thing that I never talked about because I was always scared to talk about it. But I have this cluster headaches, which yeah. happen every year multiple times a year and it just like I'm, I'm just sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm on the meeting and I have to get this shot because I'm like just falling on the floor and then I spend a couple of weeks I can't even like do anything like yeah. I'm just like in my bed and so like but I'm still making it right yeah. it's near possible but I have yeah. this side that I don't talk about I'm scared about it yeah. but I think most people go through I mean yeah. different type of batch it's it, right it's normal humans. it's human just human beings trying our best 
with a lot of imperfections and flaws and challenges and just trying our best. We just talked a lot about one of your biggest passion, crypto. There's another one that you have, taking pictures. <laughs> I would say it was. I would say, people love saying that because it's on my website. I would say it used to be more of a passion, less so today. I'd say I most of my um, content creation is in the form of tweets. Mm. Like that's I've I've I did picture I took photos for a long time. I was a photographer, um, not like a super serious one, but I like had a camera and I read about photography and I figured out how to take photos. I have some nice photos, but um, I don't feel called to it in the same way I feel called to speaking, you know, and like writing. And so I find that like my real, the, the place where I have my best creativity and the best thought is in written, in the written form. So I write a lot, um, but mostly internal docs. So I don't publish that much. Like I don't have a, I, don't have a, I used to have a blog. I wrote a blog for a long time, but um, I, 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 I haven't in a long time. And I think that's because a lot of my energy is going into internal communications for like the team and you know, trying to set vision and all those things. But I, I, I tweet a lot, like a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. I was like preparing that. I was like, ah, usually I go through a few tweets and I'm like, this is a danger. This is yeah, a danger. Yeah. And I'm like, I spent the last five minutes calling and I'm still only two days ago. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a little crazy. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's really crazy. Um, but, you know, it's working. It's working for me. And are your tweets a kind of like summary of these internal notes that you take? A lot or, of time, yeah, yeah. A lot of the time, it's like I'll have an idea, and that will be an internal ex like thing that I'll start, and then I'll also tweet some like version of it. Um, or like I've started doing every Friday now. I publish a little video, like I that, it's in my to do list every Friday. It's like record a video and share it on Twitter, and I just think like, what do I? What's top of mind for me, and like what's important, and then I'll record a little like screen share video where I talk through things, and I'll publish it on Twitter. Um, and so yeah, I'm I'm. I actually think this is one of my strengths and, and one of our team's strengths is um, we're, we have a very, like we have very good messaging clarity. Like we have a very clear mission, a very clear strategy, the work that we do ladders up to that strategy and mission. And then I'm relentless in like hammering it mm. every single opportunity I get, you know, like how many times have I said basis mission is to build a global on-chain economy that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom. Like every meeting that we have, that's a team meeting, we open, and this I learned from Brian as well, we open with the mission, the vision, and the strategy. Mm -hmm. Every single team meeting. Same thing. And people, you know, people like, they tune out sometimes, but man, you just, in order to get anyone to understand or remember, like you just have to say things so many times. Um, and that's kind of how I feel about Twitter. Like Twitter, you know, for, for, for my team, I'm in Slack with them, I'm doing meetings with them, but for the base economy, like most of the time, those people don't have any, like touch points with me. They're not in meetings with me. But if or, in order for us to build the best version of base, like we all have to do it together. Like I can't do it alone. Our can't, team can't do it alone. Everyone has to do it together. And in order to get all of us working together in the right way, we need to be thinking the same things, we need to be believing the same things. And the best way to accomplish that is by having me be relentlessly communicating, here's what's Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. Here's how this new thing fits in. Here's how that new thing fits in. Here's how all these pieces come together to let us accomplish our mission over the next five years. What's something you believe in that most people would not agree with? Yeah. I mean, the like obvious one is that like on chain is going to eat the internet and everything will be on chain in the next five years and billions of people will be on chain. Five years. Yeah. 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 I think. I'd be surprised if it took longer than that. Yeah. I mean, I think I think people often connect crypto to the internet and they're like, oh, like crypto is following the trend of the internet. Now, the difference with crypto and the internet is that the internet, in order to get global distribution, it had to deploy hardware everywhere. Mm -hmm. You literally had to run fiber and get phones in the hands of every single person. That's a long deployment cycle. You had to get point of sale systems into the, you know, every business in order for people to accept credit cards. With crypto, it's all already there. We have the internet. The internet's yeah. there. Yeah. And so all we're talking about is a switch of the apps. Like we're upgrading the system. It's like we're installing the software update on all of our computers. And that, when you look at how fast consumer products can go viral, like TikTok went from zero to you know 700 million users in a few years. Like mm -hmm. 
that's we're going to hit the inflection point where like the technology is good enough and the user experiences are good enough and the products are good enough where we're going to start seeing viral social products on chain and it's going to be like bam 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 and then the whole world's going to be on chain and so i think that people have been kind of lulled into like a little bit of like <laughs> slow complacency by the first 10 years of crypto and in the next five years it's going to change very dramatically and that we've now entered the window like we are in the window mm. where someone out there right now is building a billion user on chain app i don't know who it is i don't know where it's going to show up first but someone's building it because the technology is finally ready you talk about the next five years what's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months the next 12 months um i think that within the next 12 months and i <laughs> i was um I was, we, we just launched this thing called base names, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, like it's your on chain identity. Uh, it's like one name lets you do everything. Um, and we were talking about it with kind of the Coinbase like leadership group, which is, you know, people over like a certain level of seniority at the company, about 200 people in there. Um, we just gave them an overview. Here's what base names is. Here's how you can claim your base name. And Alicia Haas, who's our CFO, who's been at the company for five years. Um, she, you know, listened and everyone was excited and, you know, doing lots of little clapping emojis. And then, you know, she gets off the, she, she raises her hand and she's like, okay, Jesse, last summer you told me to do on chain summer and get a CB.ID name and install a Coinbase wallet app. And this summer you are telling me to get a base name and a new smart wallet, but the smart wallet doesn't connect to the Coinbase wallet app and the base name and the CB.ID are different. Like, why is this confusing? And why are we telling people different things than last year? And what I said was last year, we went in with the products that we thought were going to help people get on chain. And uh, what we learned was if you have to install a mobile app to order, in order to get on chain, it's a minimum of five minutes and you're going to lose people. And we learned that if you had an identity that was not really on chain, you lost a bunch of the, like interoperability. So you can actually get the best form of the identity that could have verifications and social stuff built into it. And we also learned that the L2s weren't cheap enough. It was still too expensive. You know, like people were building and way too expensive for everyday people. And so we took those learnings at the end of last year and we said, okay, let's go solve those problems. And we built a smart wallet and we built base names and we scaled base 10X. And now we have this new next generation of products, which like took all the learnings from the first generation of products and put them on chain. And all of them individually are really powerful, but they're not working together. And they're also not uh, seamlessly transitioning people from the old way it was to this new way of what well, it will be that will be super powered. Mm -hmm. And I think within 12 months, all of those pieces will work together. And it will be not only the best consumer experience of any financial or any login app experience ever, it will also be the best developer experience for people who are building apps. Because... When these pieces work together, low cost L2s, uh, smart wallets that are infinitely programmable, and then base names that give you a single on-chain identity that can have all of your information, all of your social graph, all of your you know, KYC if you want to share that in a private way, that will make it so developers can integrate one line of code and out of the box, they can get an interface where they can pass anything to it. They can say, hey, do this transaction and the smart wallet combined with the base name, we'll figure out how to do it. And just execute it, whether it's a mint or buying a physical good or whatever it is. If you need the user information, if you need KYC, if you need shipping information, it's all gonna be behind one facade and it's all gonna be packaged in this private, secure, easy to use interface that you set up by just doing a fingerprint, it takes less than 10 seconds. And that combination of the most powerful login for developers ever, that's 10x better than existing OAuth, and has built-in identity information and payment information and shipping information and KYC information, combined with the most powerful user login ever, that means you have one account with all your money that works everywhere, that's totally global, and that's incredibly cheap and easy to use. That is what's gonna enable the next generation of on-chain products. And today we have all the pieces because we spent the last nine months building those pieces. And the next phase that we're gonna execute on in the next 12 months is putting the pieces together and making them so they just work so freaking good that everyone's like, holy crap, this is 10X better than anything else I've ever done. And I don't think other people quite see it yet, um, but I, been working on this for you know, a decade now and in, in the last two years really focused on this specific problem and we are so close we just need to do the hard work to, to get the final 10 percent. which if you're an engineer and you're like listening to this it's like the final 10 percent is always the hardest but we're gonna nail the crap out of it it's gonna be an incredible experience 
the one liner of this podcast is I sit down every week with the most based people in crypto. <laughs> I think that was a pretty fucking based conversation. <laughs> so yeah, I wanted to thank you so much for, yeah. first for doing that, yeah. taking almost two hours of your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for this amazing energy and thank you for working so hard every day yeah. to make the world a better place. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, making us get here today. Guys, a lot of fun. Thank you.